Hi friends, Theophany. So you might be thinking to yourself, I'm sorry, what did you just say? Theophany. What's a theophany? And why should I care? And why is this a part of the video? And what does this mean to me? Well, it means a lot. A theophany is an appearance of God where God encounters a human person. And we see it over and over and over again. And not just in the New Testament, in Jesus Christ. And not just when he was living, but when he resurrected. But also in the Old Testament. Many, many theophanies. Human encounters with the divine. That changes everything. And that's why theophanies are important to us. We have to allow ourselves to live a life in which God either directly or indirectly appears to us and changes us in that encounter. And trust me, Theophanies did not stop with the Old Testament and New Testament. They continue on and on and on. And trust me, they're available to you. So a couple of examples from the Old Testament of Theophanies. Think of um, Abraham when he is... Um, barren and old and so is his wife and three mysterious figures come to him while he's in camp and they're telling him that he's going to have a child that sarah you know a year from now is going to be pregnant with a child um and in fact when sarah finds out about this you know she laughs abraham is not too convinced by this either but he does learn to trust in this um, prophecy and what's going to happen. And in fact, it does happen. Now, many biblical scholars say that these three mysterious figures are the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Long before Jesus fully reveals who each person is, that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit comes to the Father of his people because that's who Abraham becomes, is the father of Israel and the father uh, from the Old Testament of his Christian people. He comes and he says, you're going to be a father. This is a theophany. This is an appearance of God that forever changes the trajectory of Abraham's life. And from that, many nations after that. Okay. So let's look at um, his grandson, Jacob. So Jacob is um, out and about, and um, he uh, has an encounter with God. Now, in the Old Testament, um, it talks about it's an angel. But you have to remember that sometimes the angels, the messengers, that's what angelos means, um, is God's son. And so we don't know. We don't know if it, you know, if it was an angel or if it was um, the second person of the Holy Trinity. But either directly or through a, a medium, through an angel, Jacob is having an encounter with God. I mean, a, like a real life one. He wrestles with the angel. And um, f through the wrestling, a couple of things happen. He says, I'm not going to let go of you until you bless me. And so ultimately, he, he blesses him. And he changes his name from Jacob to Israel. And so he eventually then uh, uh, fathers the, the, the 12 tribes of Israel, the 12 sons of Jacob of Israel, become the heads, the leaders of the 12 tribes of Israel, the nation of Israel. But not before he struck in the, in the hip, the, the, the sciatic. Um, and he forever walks with a limp because of, of the encounter that he has with God. Sometimes the encounters we have with God are great blessings, like um, in this case, uh, the birth of a son. Uh, but other times, while they change our name, meaning change our trajectory, our identity and the mission, uh, they come at a cost. We, we have to let go of something. Um, we, we walk with a limp. We're not the same person. And sometimes we run. 
I mean, the, these theophanies are many in the scriptures, and they have many and diverse effects upon those who have this encounter. Okay, so here we are today, living in very strange times. Uh, many of us are filled with fear and darkness and confusion. There's a great division in our country. Many people are struggling with their faith and their hope and wondering what the future is going to be like. So what do we do as Christians, not just for ourselves, but for them, as we try to navigate these troubled waters of our lives and of these days? If Scripture teaches us anything, it's precisely during these times that God will come to us in a theophany. And it can, again, be in many in, in varied ways. It can be a vision. It can be a dream. It can be in time of prayer and, and uh, when you're in adoration or when you're in your home. It can be through a, a wise sage, a holy person, it can be through a tragedy or an accident. It can be through trauma or great triumph. It can be through um, a renewal moment. It can be through um, a, a, with other people and discipleship groups. It can be, um, it's endless because God is inexhaustible. Let me tell you a story of a, of a theophany. Alexander Solzhenitsyn. Uh, you may or may not have heard about him. Uh, he lived um, during the uh, you know the rise of the Soviet Union and of communism in so in the Soviet Union, and 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 their their oppression of their own people, not just their overtaking of many other nations, but for instance during uh, Stalin's time, um, I mean millions upon millions of people were killed just by their leader. He killed his own people, anybody who opposed him in any way, shape, or form. If they opposed him with their faith, if they opposed him with their politics, if they opposed him with their military, if they opposed him with uh, their, their money and their influence, he got rid of them. And so it was during this time that many millions of people were sent to a system called the gulags. And the gulags were... Uh, war camps, concentration camps, and they were all over um, the Soviet Union, but uh, they were especially harsh up in the north, like in Siberia, where it was deadly cold in the winter. Uh, many were sent to the gulags in Siberia to, uh, to work the camps. And most of the people who worked the gulag, they never survived, and certainly not for years, and sometimes not even for a year. This was a situation that Alexander found himself as he opposed um, the oppression of the communist, uh, both as a man, but also as a person of faith. And so there he was um, up in the gulags in Siberia, being worked to death and being frozen to death. And, and, and just really his faith had been sapped and his hope was dissipated. He was ready to die. And so he sits down uh, in the snow and is just ready to give up and, and go to sleep and, and be dead. Just as he does this, uh, somebody sits down next to him, somebody he's never seen in the gulag and, and didn't know and never met. And the man doesn't say anything to him, not a word. But he picks up a twig, a stick or something, and he draws in, in the snow in front of Alexander. What he draws in the snow is the shape of a cross. And then he points to the cross. And Alexander looks at the cross. And he remembers that it was in the cross that God drew all of humanity. And all the suffering. And all the death and all the sin and all the losses of humanity to himself. And he experienced all of it so that there could be a resurrection in our life, so that there could be hope, so that there could be new life, Not only in the life of heaven, but in many steps along the way for many of us. And all of this just starts coming flooding back to him. 
and his hope is restored and his faith is renewed. And he turns to this man to thank him and the man is gone. And he never saw him in his remaining days in the gulag. He only saw him that one time. That's a theophany. And how many times does God send people like that to us who we know and who we don't know? But maybe because we're not disposed as people of faith to know that this is one of the ways that God communicates to us, we totally miss him pointing something out to us or something inside of us or a way forward. This can be any number of people in our lives. It can be a, a wise sage who's been there and done that before us. It could be somebody who's just a good listener, has a caring heart. It could be a holy person who could pray for us and is moved by the Holy Spirit to say the right word at the right time to the right person, to you. Alexander had the history and enough experiences in the ways of faith and human living to recognize this was a theophany. And that theophany forever changed the trajectory of his life. And one of the things that he spent the rest of his life doing was not concentrating in the concentration camp on all of his suffering and all of his loss and all of his dashed dreams and all of his dissipated hopes and all of the oppression and all of the injustices. What he did was concentrate on the cross and on Jesus Christ, and uniting all of that to the cross so that he could see through everything that I just mentioned, and he could see other people. And he spent the rest of his life helping other people. You know, indeed we live in strange times, and there are many fears and confusion and visions, and we as people, even people of faith, struggle with sadness and with depression and we, and, 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 and we want to give up and we want to sit down and we don't want to engage and we don't want to rock the boat and we don't want to um, uh, do anything other than try to survive. And what we end up doing is sitting down in, in all this junk and all this darkness when we could be using all this junk and all this darkness not only as a way to draw closer to God's redeeming touch through the cross that we're experiencing. But then through that, we can reach out to so many other people in our lives, people that we know and people that we don't know, who need us. But we're so consumed by our own suffering that we cannot see the suffering of others or do anything about it. And you know, the whole Christian life is the reverse of that. It's Jesus being consumed by suffering, our suffering, and still seeing us in the suffering, and taking all that suffering into himself, and redeeming us so that he could spend all of eternity helping us. And we take his name, Christ. We call ourselves Christiani little Christians, little Christ. And if we are truly Christian, or trying our best to live Christians, then one of the best ways to live as a Christian is to let God be God. And let God come to us in the theophany. And I'm telling you, He will. He will. Not in the ways that you'll expect Him to, but he'll come to us directly or indirectly. He'll come to us in circumstances and situations of our lives or people in our lives. He'll come to us in trauma and accidents. He'll come to us in promotions and victories and triumphs. He'll come to us. And when he comes to us, he wants us to take whatever it is that we're going through, the, the good times or the bad times, and unite it to him so that we can use the good times and the bad times, not for ourselves to give up or uh, to forget about everything because everything is going well, but to use all of that then to reach out to other people and draw them closer to Jesus Christ. That's what Christ did. And that's what we as little Christ, Christians, 
are supposed to do. And that's what a theophany can do. And that's why it's important. And that's what to do with it. Until next time, people, let's uh, be praying for those theophanies.